You're tuned into the Writing Community Chat Show, the live streaming YouTube podcast that brings you the stories of authors, screenwriters and more. Indie or established, this show's for the community and we invite you to be a part of it. Head to the writingcommunitychatshow.com for more info. The WCCS, together as one, we get it done. Hello and welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show. Hello and welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show, where we talk about everything from writer's block and the proper way to make a cup of tea, Chris, and what to drink to fuel those late night writing sessions. Uh, So get yourself a drink, kick back and relax and join us for an interesting show, as always. And we've got another great guest coming up for you. And it's great to see you in the chat. Hello, Chris Hooley. How are you doing this week? I'm very good. Thank you. How are you? Um, sunburn. <laughs> uh, the sun came out in Wales for one day, and that's what happens to us, well, uh, as Welsh people. Um, yeah, so that that was yesterday. Today it's raining again. Back to normality. How are you? Not yeah, sunburn. I mean, no, not sunburn, not at all. Um, during the little trailer there at the beginning, I, I've never looked at it in quite the same way before. But I was trying to spot who we'd had on in like it's, the little yeah. bits. Like, oh, I remember that person. Yeah, it's it's. Obviously, season 11, uh, 11 seasons is is incredible, but mm. people might not notice at the start, there's there's two um, photo blocks with indie authors and uh, other authors on there as well. And there's loads of pictures of guests we've had on. So it, it'll take a while to pick those out there. Yeah, I mean, I, it was difficult not to spot Melanie Blake in her yep. red dress, uh, smack bang in the center. But then once I'd seen her, I was like, oh, who else is... On the, yeah, um, she's there in a dress, as is Tina Baker in her green dress, which is also just as uh, dazzling. Um, yeah, hello to you all in the chat as well. Um, nice to see you there. Um, yeah, speaking of being Welsh, there is a festival starting today. And last week we had Matt Johnson on the show. He was fantastic. Really good guest and a lot of good feedback from that interview. So do check that out. Uh, the Guild Crime Cymru Festival starts today, which is the first ever Crime Writers Festival in Wales. And he is a big part of setting that up. So congratulations to everyone who helped set that up and is part of that festival that starts today. It's in Aberystwyth in West Wales, a beautiful place. You can check that out online and see what they're up to. So please do so. And if you're in the area, why not check that out? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very cool thing. Hopefully we can be there next year as well, Chris. Um, I know mm. we're going to go Harrogate this year and we're very excited, but it'd be nice to change that up as well. Yeah, it would. I mean, tonight, obviously, we're going to go up to Scotland. Um, with a Scottish author uh, on yep. the show, which is interesting. But yeah, if you're in Wales um, and you are into your crime fiction, then yeah, check that out. In where? Aberystwyth. <laughs> <laughs> Aberystwyth. Yeah. Aberystwyth. Right, okay. Um, also trending everywhere on Twitter right now is the blue tick um, issue. And a lot of people are seeing that as a negative and fleeing Twitter. But also, if you are someone that's trying to maybe get ahead in the game of, of whatever your sort of trade is having that tick at the moment will get you more exposure possibly an area to attach yourself and get get more exposure also controversial as chris just went Ooh. um but yeah it's interesting on that one um but i, w- I wouldn't do it personally just mm-hmm. because not because i begrudge paying the money or anything but just because of the people who attack people with the blue tick yeah. and they drop things in there like blue tick things that they say um i'm not saying <laughs> blue tick <laughs> but, yeah um but yeah that that would put me off at the, at the moment maybe you'll change it up maybe you'll change it around yeah so yeah. you're already getting negativity thrown at you from that absolutely um but also what we did tweet about last week we had a good conversation off the back of uh, one of our tweets this mm-hmm. week um the question was about what do you love about writing and it was quite a broad question you know there's there's many avenues to go down in that in that route but the overwhelming response was world building and world building mm. is something that I really appreciate as an, as an author and a reader as one of the most difficult things to do because it's so complex. And by all, by all accounts, Tolkien, for example, in um, Lord of the Rings took over 10 years to create that world. And obviously he made maps and languages. It is, it's a really complex thing. So world building, we have a lot of um, appreciation for, 
And I think consistency is key. If you are going down that route, you've got to make sure that everything lines up. So you can imagine starting a project 10 years early, you know, 10 years difference. You've mm. got to make sure those things work together when the story comes through. Have you ever delved into the world building process, Chris? Um, no, not like Tolkien. Um, beautiful maps. I mean, it'd take me 10 years just to do a map, let alone write, <laughs> write some novels to, attached to the map. But yeah. They are fantastic, and you know, kudos to anyone who can do that. Um, yeah, I struggle just getting words on a page, so I'm happy when they appear. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Cool. Are you ready for tonight's guest, Chris? I am indeed. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Yep. Yeah, um, you can see. Yeah, Chris has got a copy of that book. There's one right there, and of course, it's in the top corner above his head, as usual. Um, the main we'll get. So tonight's guest is an accomplished national newspaper journalist with 20 years of experience, which is fabulous. Um, Kate's passion for her hometown of Edinburgh and its uh, history has not only made her an exceptional journalist, but also a talented author. Her debut novel, which is The Maiden, Chris is holding it right there, very nice uh, display, um, is earned the, <laughs> the prestigious Bloody Scotland Pitch Perfect 2020 Prize for New Writers, which is an amazing uh, feat. And we are here, uh, thrilled to have her here today to share her journey with us, her road to writing, and we'll dig into her experiences in the world of journalism, her creative process as an author, and how Edinburgh's past has influenced her writing. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kate Foster. Hello, Kate. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me on. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and spending your Friday night with us. It's great to have you here. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good. I um, finished work about an hour ago and I've got uh, two weeks holiday coming up mm. because my, my novel is being launched on Thursday. So I've taken a couple of weeks of annual leave just to kind of get all that done. Amazing. Nice to have a couple of weeks off and it must be very exciting with a, a book that's been in the, in the process for quite some time and had some awards before it's, it's it's big launch so how are you feeling about that right now um I f i'm i'm really excited i'm just you know it's such a long process so i think i probably signed my publishing contract about um about a year and a half two years ago so that's mm. that's how long it really takes to get um you know to get a hardback book out out there um so the fact it's i'm on the kind of countdown now um it's it's really exciting um i, I don't know i mean i've been nervous about it i'm feeling I'm probably just a bit a bit less nervous now because it's totally inevitable there's nothing i could do to stop it really <laughs> um, happening. So, yeah it's happening um and and you know i've i've, I've got i've got the actual i've got an actual um, copy of, of the, the heart back here um this is the waterstones edition which has sprayed so um i feel like i, I just i feel very very privileged and i'm just kind of looking to see what what the roller coaster brings definitely are you in, in edinburgh right now i literally in uh, edinburgh i'm in christorfen where um, some of the novel is set so um so yes mm. i'm i'm literally there nice <laughs> amazing there's so much about edinburgh we will we'll talk about that a bit later on because there's a there's one of the reviews i pulled out that discusses parts of this um but it's definitely somewhere that i have not been yet and it's on my list to go next year i'm, I'm very much waiting to go and, and some of our audience in fact have been there and everyone speaks highly of, of it and and kind of this sense you get around edinburgh and, and the sort of creativity that oozes from it so we would love to talk about that very soon and in fact halo just says there oh chris has just popped that up i love Ed edinburgh um and a lot of yeah. people do that so what is the weather they like right now because more often than not the perception is that it's raining and quite gloomy it's i'm at the window um for all to see me um it's okay it's uh, it's been it's been okay it's not been sunny because you've got sunburn but it's certainly not been sunburn weather here <laughs> it literally went to like 17 degrees yesterday uh, um, and that was the first sunny day after spring so off spring um crazy so what we like to do kate is we like to delve into the first part of the show which is called the road to writing so we'll play a little video and then we'll ask some questions about your past and and about your writing processes and, and we'll get into that so i'll play this and let's do it <laughs> So, Kate, could you please let everybody know where your inspiration to write was, uh, what, what that was in the first place? And do you kind of remember what the first step was for you? 
In terms of writing the maiden? Uh, no, writing in general. Uh, mm -hmm. So, well, I just spark. I, I, I don't I don't remember a time when I when I wasn't creatively writing. Uh, I think it was just something which I, I I've got just really early childhood memories of just writing sort of random little oh, short sure. stories, um, oh. and you know um little poems and 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 things like that with, with little drawings i think it's just been always something that i've that i've done um but as i you know go th went through life there were certainly periods of time where i i wasn't engaged with that creative process at all and even i wasn't even reading fiction at all so it's been a bit up and down um, I think that I, I did creative writing as part of my uh, degree at the University of Stirling and uh, that was the first time I actually thought I could probably take writing seriously because I was getting critical feedback, which was okay. Some of it, you know, some of the stuff I was writing because I was, you know, 21 year old, you know, student. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, my, my tutor was very patient with me and, and so at that point I kind of thought, well, maybe I could um, do, do some of this a bit more. Um, uh, and I did try to tackle a novel a couple of times, but you know, you know, life gets in the way. And I didn't really sit down and write, uh, really give give it a go until after my two children were of an age where they could be kind of, they were a bit more independent, and I just had a little bit more space. Um, and that's when I thought, now, now it's now or never. Amazing. So, when you first. <sighs> you started writing all of these different things did you know there was one direction you wanted to go into because you mentioned sort of poetry and, and these other kind of writings and academically as well did you know that an author was kind of the, the direction you wanted to go in because you ultimately you went into journalism for a, a good professional career so did you know what direction you were going to at that point yeah I, I certainly remember wanting to have a book um and I don't think I I, I really knew what that book would ever be about because I think it takes a while uh, for some authors to kind of work out what they want to say. Um, so I, I think I just dabbled in everything, and and as I, as I became more disciplined in my journalism, um, and I was kind of, and I can write a five hundred word article pretty quickly. Um, I started to want to play with something a lot, you know, just a, a much more kind of substantial kind of piece. And so I almost was kind of doing the opposite. I wanted to kind of do the opposite of what, of what I was doing every day and just kind of plunge into a completely different type of work. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a definitely yeah. a different process. Do you, do you remember um, getting into journalism? Did you kind of take that process of writing quite naturally and then the same for the transition from journalism into fictional writing. Did you kind of, were you quite natural at those or was it a learning curve for you at either stage? Well, it's always the learning curve. I mean, gosh, you go into it thinking you're fantastic. And then, <laughs> you know, somebody comes along and just completely, say, you know, red pen everywhere. And still, you know, I'm still in my in my journalism. I've been doing it for, I think, actually 25 years. And still I will have, you know, work, you know, it needs, it needs to be edited. It needs an extra pair of eyes on it before it can actually be, you know, read um, by by the public um, so yes yes it does come naturally in terms of you know your understanding of language your understanding of um storytelling but but i i just think um you need to have a really good kind of editor feedback situation going on and i've done creative writing courses and and i think that my my um my work has, because because it's a craft, has has improved with every single piece of feedback that you know that, that I've had, and I'm still you know I'm still getting you know stuff chucked back at me now. That's amazing. And with the um, the maiden, obviously you started to write. Um, you went on a Curtis Brown course and wrote this in six months. Is that right? Correct me if I'm wrong there. Well, the course was six months. And then um, I had managed to write about, I think, about half of it within that time. But I, you know, had I had um, done, done a bit of it already, and then I went onto the course, and, and there's really a lot of work there on your kind of opening up two or three chapters and about your story development. And I think I'd, I'd got about maybe about half of it done by by the time I I um, I, I finished that course. Hmm. And what made you want to go on a course and like have someone like put you right in the part and what was you hoping to learn? Well, I I'd um I kind of was at a place in, in life where 
I knew that in order to get a commercial um, novel published, you have to, it has to do certain things. So it has to be a really interesting story. It has to tick certain boxes. It has to be written in a certain way. And I had already done a story, a, a novel, which was completely different from The Maiden, and it's just still sitting in a drawer. You know, like a lot of, you know, every author's got a, a novel that sits in a drawer, right? We've, we've all got that book um, that, that's just awful and, 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 and should never be read. But it's, you know, but so... So the kind of rejection process from that, maybe about 15 to 20 rejections on that novel, told me very clearly that, you know, if you're going to get published, it's going to have to be a certain a certain type of um, uh, story. And so I thought if I do, you know, if I do, if I do kind of this Curtis Brown course, I mean, there are other courses are available, then then at least it will give me a really good chance um, of understanding how commercial fiction works. And understanding the kind of ingredients of, um, you know, what kind of makes a novel that can kind of sit happily on a bookshelf with other novels. What I really like about the, the takeaway from that, what I really like is is the fact that you had multiple rejections and you had criticism in certain areas, but you always took that as creative creative criticism, and you used it as motivation to uh, to progress and to improve. And I think that's a really important message for new writers especially who are looking to get um submit uh, submit their work and to get picked up to take those criticisms positively because it if in the wrong mindset that could potentially you could have gone in a different direction and not published that work as a result uh, i mean yeah i mean literally i think i think 15 to 20 rejections on my first book the maiden was also rejected um in terms of the concept of it it, it was rejected um by a couple of agents and it was also, you know, I, I mean, I've got, I've got, I've got a great publishing deal, but it was, it was also rejected by a number of publishers. So, yeah. um, um, you just have, yeah, you, you just have to sort of, I think, I think it's hard. And, uh, but, but if you, if you really want to kind of go for it, you know, you, you have to kind of listen to some of the constructive criticism that you're getting, and mm. uh, just kind of move forward with it. Okay, you mentioned obviously about having written a novel that stayed in a drawer beforehand. Um, so how did you change your approach to write The Maiden based on the feedback that you were being given? And where did the initial idea come from? Um, well, if I, so, I mean, I literally didn't, I mean, my, my first novel was really, I think, about me uh, um telling myself I could I, I could get to 85,000 words. So that is a, such a huge achievement for anybody to to get to. If you, if, if anybody that's done that has, has I mean, to even now with all of the stuff that's happened with the maiden and all of the, all of the spreads and, and, and everything like that, I still, the biggest achievement for me was getting to the end of my first novel and the feeling that I had when I had completed that, it's still up there. So I would say that that is a huge, you know, a huge kind of um, achievement. Um, so I, I had to kind of unpick. So I had gone for a genre, which was it's not very commercial. Uh, it was probably a bit overwritten. And it just, it, I think if I'd taken the same story and put it into a different sort of, I made it, you know, I made it more commercial, it, it, it might have been okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, so then I, I come on to my idea. So I kind of knew what, I know what works and I know what's not going to work. Mm. And I, I was kind of fishing around for, you know, for ideas for, for, for book two. And the story of uh, The Maiden, it's, it's inspired by a true story. Um, uh, it's a story about um, a, a woman who, who lived in 17th century Storfin, um, which is where I live, it's a suburb of Edinburgh, mm. and she was um, condemned to death uh, for for murdering her lover. Now that story was part of my childhood when I was growing up here. Um, Christian Nemo, her ghost is said to haunt the village of Storfin, and as a child growing up, she was just part of my own kind of you know history heritage. We learned about the story at school. And I did write, we had to, you know, as part of the school project, we had to do a little, can you imagine, you know, the scene, you know, as Christian, you know, where does her, you know, lover? And, and and that was literally, and I remember very clearly drawing, you know, writing it out, you know, this kind of um, scene of kind of passionate, you know, um, 
revenge with the with a with a sword, and I drew a little picture of uh, her stabbing her her lover and the and the blood coming out, and uh, and that was very satisfying for me as as a child. And um, so this this story had kind of just kind of been with me and. The, the ghost of Christian Nimmo was 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 something that I was frightened of as a child. Um, mm. She's a haunt particular part of Christorfin, um, and I and I do remember being nervous walking past this 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 area. It's in it's in the old in the old village, and think, oh, maybe you know, maybe she'll come and get me. Um, <laughs> and as an adult, um, and as an adult, maybe she will actually will come and get me now. And as an adult, um, the um, when I when I kind of came back to Christorfin uh, and moved mm. back. Here, I, I and I remember the story. The first thing that kind of came to mind for me was, well, I'm, I'm not frightened of her anymore. And 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 I was really interested in number one, um, why am I not frightened of her anymore? And, mm. and number two, is 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 that is my interest in her enough en enough to kind of take it through a whole kind of novel? So I, mm. I kind of thought it's probably enough for for, for 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 a story, but it probably needs a bit more. And I wanted to bring in other characters. And so rather than try and sort of tell the story of Christian Nimmo faithfully, I, I've used the the murder as an inspiration for, you know, mm. for a historic novel which is set to sort of in Christorfin, but also in Edinburgh, which is a fascinating time, um, period of time. They were just coming out of the plague and um, people were living you know, on top of each other in tenement closes and chucking their you know, shit out of the windows. So mm -hmm. why, you know, how can you not have that as part of your book? So I, mm -hmm. I really wanted to have the voice of Christian Nimmo, but I also wanted to have the voice of a woman who was living in Edinburgh at that time. And I wanted to, I, I thought about whether there had maybe been a kind of like a sex industry in Edinburgh, because um, it's not part of our, you know, ghost tours that we get now and i kind yeah. of decided that there was one and i and i've got a prostitute who who, who comes from the um a brothel mrs fiddis's uh, house of pleasure in edinburgh and they and they kind of meet with christian and our and our poor murder victim and it all just goes tip -top. Hmm. it's an amazing story and 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 some of the history of edinburgh is just absolutely outstanding um and intriguing and it's like you mentioned about the stories you believe as a child and growing up and whether you still find them kind of intimidating or scary and Ross says it's a bit like E.T. as a child you might find him a bit scary but as an adult wouldn't that be kind of weird did, did you still feel like that you believed in kind of ghosts um, as an adult or, or is that why you f felt or if you didn't is that why you felt less impacted by that story? I, I, I don't um, I don't believe in them uh, but I've had like um moments of thinking have i raised the dead with this you know and <laughs> moments when i've thought should i have done this um you know this was all you know this was all years ago i was forgotten about this it's, you know she's there's a pub named after her and that's about it you know why have i come along and sort of you know been really dramatic about this and, and i think it's because um we don't really hear from christian in in the in in the, in the story so um so i wanted to kind of you know give her a voice but in mm. terms of um yeah, I certainly. I mean, I mean, I certainly. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, no, I don't believe in ghosts. But um, I, I've had. I've de definitely had moments of thinking. Oh, hmm. yes. <laughs> Amazingly, I, I got to watch um, Evil Dead today. It's out in the cinema today, and that was all about raising the dead. I mean, in Edinburgh, there must be so many haunted stories, and obviously, you got tours there as well. Uh, there's a big scene for that. So, did you ever feel like you wanted to write that kind of story, a, a more gruesome, darker story? Um, I, I think, I, I, yeah, maybe. I mean, I'm, I'm looking, I'm fishing around for you know other uh, other ideas. I'm already writing my second book, um, which is kind of based in Edinburgh as well. Um, and I just think there's so many things, isn't there? Um, mm. Edinburgh has a, a huge trade in its in its horrible past. Mm. Okay, how did you, obviously, as a journalist, um, with that background for research, how did you incorporate research with fiction to the point where you felt that the maiden was authentic enough to Edinburgh, but also had enough elements of fiction for you to play with and enjoy as a writer, if that makes sense? Yeah, so, um, so I... Did a, did a few things which were quite specific. So I I went to um, I kind of went around Christoff and, and kind of with my kind of um, research hat hat on, mm. 
And then I went, did the same with Edinburgh, went to Mary King's Close, um, went to the museum, um, Chamber Street Museum, although well, that was a bit, a bit later because we were in lockdown. Um, and I, and I um, read things like um, Samuel Pepys's diaries and just kind of immersed myself in how were people thinking at, at, at that time. Mm. I, I had to do a lot of online research because we were in lockdown when I was, you know, when I was writing it. I actually would have done the same even if we weren't in lockdown because it's literally all there. But I was really careful that I wasn't just kind of like Googling this and Googling that. I mean, my Google search history was just at one point, it was just like tremendous. Um, and I had to like delete it because that was embarrassing. Um, I, th I would love to be able to put a book together of, of authors' best uh, search history terms for research for books because there would be some amazing questions in there and very questionable yeah, ones as well. Very questionable because I was writing about a kind of passionate love affair in the, in the 17th century. <laughs> uh, so I was googling all sorts. Anyways, I deleted all of that and it was all fine. Um, but but yeah, so um, and also things like so I I was watching things that weren't quite in the 17th century, but I was I watched um, loads of stuff. I watched American Scots film. Um, mm. And I and I watched Harlots, which is I think Channel Four um, drama based on a brothel. Um, I think it might be the nineteenth century, I think, the eighteenth century. I'm not quite sure, but it's just things around that, you know, just where mm. you know, because you, know, you can't. There's not a lot about the seventeenth century, particularly you know, sixteen seventy nine. There was like you know, not a lot was known. Um, mm. There was a few things noted that happened in Edinburgh that year, but they weren't you know, they weren't massive. Mm. I honestly don't think I would have survived very well in any of the, the history when you look at medievals or castle times. There's loads of castle in Wales. Just just the fact of living in a castle with no windows and a big breeze, I would be done. I just couldn't do it. And forget the torture side of it, just living in those conditions is horrendous enough in my eyes. I think the no windows is the least of your problems if you're... I know, like, but like, I, I'd be freezing. I hate the cold. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's it's really dark, isn't it? Our history is very dark. And Edinburgh really kind of shows that off in, in in all its glory, if you know what I mean. And yeah. what, what what is something that you kind of love about Edinburgh in that sense? Is there something that really, I mean, even as a kid, a uh, child, was there anything, an area, even more specifically, that you like to go in and, and were drawn to the darker side of it? Well, uh, the high street of Edinburgh um, is everybody knows the high street. But I, I mean, I've been associated with the high street since I was a, a child because mm. I had a friend who lived just on a, on a, on a close off the high street. So I used to go to her house all the time. And we just, you know, we were kind of like teenagers, being ridiculous. And then as a as a young person, it was where I used to go underage drinking. And then, <laughs> you know, and 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 then um, even even. Um, we, we used to go to like a, a nightclub, which was just kind of near the high streets. We used to go up a close and drink a bottle of martini before we would go to the nightclub. And, you know, going up to, they used to have Hogmanay up, up, up at the high street before it was down on Princess Street. And even, you know, just everything. American schools is very cool. And um, so my own, and even I was, I was, um, when I was writing some of the chapters of the Maiden, which are set in the high street, particularly the final chapters, and it was really a kind of like my kind of, I was really trying to get to express my love for for for, for Edinburgh, and mm -hmm. I and I was just mingling all of my own personal memories of it with what was happening um, to, to to the characters. Mm, brilliant. Okay, how do you how do you manage writing a, a narrative that's set so many hundreds of years ago? But then you've got all the same sort of things that would happen in terms of like romantic love affairs and things like that. Like, how do you, because my natural instinct would be, I'm just going to write it and then I'm going to kind of go back in the editing stage and make it more authentic to the time period. What was your process and how did you do it? I, I went in a lot of rabbit holes, actually, so it's probably quite slow. Cool. Mm. Um what what what's the difference? I mean, I, I think I think what I think what I was doing was my 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 aim, and one of my tutors, um, Lisa O'Donnell, who's a fantastic novelist, she um, she said this to me. She she said, "Don't make your characters historical characters. Make them modern characters. Otherwise, your modern readers are just gonna, they're not going to like them." Hmm. So um, you know, so you're trying to make your um, characters feel and and do the things that we would do, but just with the constraints of you know petticoats and breeches and you know not being allowed to you know leave, leave the house on your own so mm. I kind of wrote it I mean I just kind of thought to myself almost in character you know 
How is she getting from A to B? Is she on a horse? Is somebody with her? You know, these are all the things that you're kind of thinking. For me, mm. it had to all happen at once. And of course, you go back and then you kind of add things in and then maybe mm. put a margin note saying, you know, needs needs work. Um, but but for me, it was about being very much in the moment as, as I was writing it. Mm. What is your writing style in that sense then? Are you someone who is... A, a plotter or someone that can kind of follow the characters in that sense where you're you're putting yourself in that in that in that time scale um, i do need a, a reasonable structure um okay. and um but then you know as you know as soon as you kind of have your character and then they just they, they do something wrong don't i mean they just they just do a different thing don't they um and so it's just a weird thing that writers can understand <laughs> <laughs> um, if, um you mentioned that. Um, where have we gone with this now? I've just lost that completely. It was a good question as well. Oh my goodness! You can come back to it. I'll come back to it. Yeah. I think what you were saying is obviously sometimes when your characters are in the moment um, and they just go off on their own tangent, how do you then fold that into the the original idea that you had? How do you just go? Do you just let it happen? Let the chaos consume? Your writing process or do you try and restrain i think it depends where i am um mm. in the editorial process if i've had editorial notes that say you know this is kind of what we think should be happening and my character is not doing it you just have to force them back into the into the, into the role they're supposed to be playing um uh, you know and, and i do get quite a lot of i mean i work quite um heavily from editorial notes from my editor um mm. just kind of you know this is what we, you know, this is maybe, you know, try this or, or do that. So mm. I think, I think sometimes, I mean, I, I had a terrible, you know, terrible um, time with, uh, so my second book, and I was really struggling with a scene. And, and, and then just one of my characters, she just dropped dead in the middle of the scene. And I think that's, <laughs> oh, you're just like, you have to just stop. And uh, <laughs> and that's when you know that you've kind of run out of ideas, you know, at that point, you have to kind of stop and then rewind and try, mm. try and do it. People just don't yeah. drop dead in the middle of in it's it's not like a, an author trying to kill off a lot of characters, is it? I mean, it's, it's kind of the natural process. Um, I've, I've remembered what I was going to say. Uh, basically, going back to you mentioned you had a mentor as well, and yeah, I've had a few. Yeah, what is it? One piece of advice that you can remember from having a mentor that could be beneficial to perhaps new writers that you could share? Oh, I've had loads. The, the, the best piece of advice I think I got um, was right at the start um, of, of my process. And I and I was very, um, oh God, I was writing in 500 word snippets because that's that was my journalism training. Yeah. And I was sitting there, you know, I was really, I, I knew I wanted to do it and I couldn't do it. I didn't know, I didn't know what my writing voice was. And mm. I went to a I went to a, a workshop run by a poet called Maggie Gibson, and she and she runs, um, you know, kind of small group uh, writing workshops, and um, I, and I was really kind of, she was getting everybody's writing these amazing things, you know, that everybody was sitting around flowing prose and all the rest of it, and I was just you know terrible, you know, and she said to me, "You have to get it out, otherwise it's going to." like this you know she said she, i had so much within me that was trying to kind of express itself that mm. if i didn't write it down she said you're you know it's, it's just gonna you're just gonna basically implode mm -hmm. and i think that for a lot of people writing as a release you know it's kind of how you express yourself it's you know it's a way of communicating with yourself with you know it's a way of you know journaling whatever and i think to me that's it's just kind of important that that that, that you just do it yeah when you're talking about being a release there's a couple of people that were, were having a good conversation in the chat earlier and they they highlighted a very important fact that whether you're reading or writing it's a great way of escapism and and expression as well so so it's a real valuable tool whether whether you're reading or writing um to get in those worlds and when we mentioned world building earlier whether it's historical you're writing about actual historical history or it's whether it's complete fiction um world building is still a very interesting way to write and it, it, it's quite fascinating about writing history of, uh, of edinburgh or any kind of history and keeping it true to the heritage of that place as well was there any kind of sensitive sensitive issues that you had to deal with or any concerns that you had while writing about writing about somewhere real that you weren't quite sure about how to do yeah, I mean, loads because um, you know I was I was writing about a real a real life case, um, and I 
and I kind of have have made things up that weren't true and I've missed things out that were true because it kind of and the reason why I did that was because I had to get the right plot I had to get the plot that worked for me as, as the author and so I had to let go of things and I kind of um you know and I'm and I'm okay with that you know yeah. I, just, I just had to say well you know you're not writing a historical textbook here you know you're writing a, a, a work of fiction so it's you know yeah it is hard I mean Edinburgh I mean there's been so much written about Edinburgh I suppose in my head I was thinking you know do we need another story really <laughs> um do we really need us and um and i also in, in one of my main characters you know she's a prostitute you know was i you know what was that the right thing to do and so you're kind of questioning yourself all the time but at the end of the day you know you just have to have a have a crack at it don't you hmm. well how do you get in the head of a I, i'm assuming there's no connection in any way here i'm not suggesting there is but as a character <laughs> as a prostitute how would you get into the mindset of a character that goes through a life like that? Well, you see, I think that um, she's just, uh, she's the, my, my characters are just ordinary women who are in, you know, circumstances beyond their control. So, yeah. I mean, Violet, I mean, Violet, who is, who is the prostitute, who's our second narrator, um, she's just, you know, any person who's, you know, who's, has, has ended up working in, in, the, in the sex industry in Edinburgh because there's not anything else to do. So mm. she's not, you don't, if you take away the, you know, kind of all the kind of stigma of that, you know, she's just, you know, she's just a, a, a woman who's trying to do her best. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't think of her as labelled, you know, I, I just thought of her as, you know, she's a bit like, I mean, I, I, I'd like to know Violet, Violet Blythe. I think she's a great person. I'd like to go out and get mm. drunk with her. You know, she's just kind of, <laughs> she talks like my, my friends and my family. Um, mm. and, and she's she's just so I just saw her as somebody who she felt like somebody that I maybe knew. I think she's maybe an amalgamation of people that that, that I know. Mm. Cool. Right, we're gonna have to put you on the spot in a second because we're gonna play the next little video and we're gonna talk about the maiden. But we've already kind of mentioned the story, but we want to hear your absolute hundred percent pitch for the story. Um, <laughs> your blurb read, your your Elevate. display of the story. Okay. So yeah. after yeah. this little video. We're going to learn about the maiden a little bit more and ask some questions around that. So this is What's the Story? So, okay, as I mentioned, I know we've discussed this kind of a little bit already, but please let everybody know what the maiden is all about. So the maiden is a, it's a historical novel some people have called it a historical thriller or a murder mystery and it tells a story of um christian nimmo who um is uh, sentenced to death for the murder of her lover lord james forrester in edinburgh in uh, 1679 but um christian is not the only woman in lord forrester's life and she's not the only one with cause to wish him dead Ooh. It's um like like we've already discussed, there's there's definitely a lot going on in this story. And I've got a review. Well, I wanna well, I want to read this review out. Which and normally I'd ask the question off the back of this, but we've actually asked these questions already. Um, but this was a review off Goodreads, and normally historically is a harsh place to go. However, yeah. all of the reviews of Goodreads were absolutely outstanding. I'm going to read this review. It's quite a lengthy one, but I think it's worth reading. Um, it says, this book is absolutely incredible, in capital letters. I was pulled in after the first page, and honestly, this is one of those books that I didn't want to end. The plot is as beautiful as the writing, with incredibly detailed characters that you can't help but root for. And Kate did a wonderful job of keeping me guessing throughout as to who the murderers could have been. I absolutely cannot recommend this one enough. And now after reading this, I have the strongest urge to go and visit Edinburgh because it sounds absolutely magical. That review is magical in itself. Yes. Um, some of the questions I'm going to ask about Edinburgh, we've already talked about that. But what I wanted to know specifically, and this can help a lot of writers, anyone who wants to write a twisty, turny book, this, this review really, and there was many others that really talked about how this book really keeps you guessing and, and no one could figure out the ending of this. How do you write something that is twisty and turny when you're developing a story? Well, I didn't know the ending when I was writing it. That's probably why. <laughs> um, you um, so you, um, I think I think I think that um, 
what what I had initially was kind of two, you know, I had two big characters and a bit of a um, murder mystery plot. I think sometimes there may be other characters um, who are in your story who maybe need to come to the forefront a bit more. Somebody who's maybe a little bit unexpected lurking in the background. I think you can, you know, use everybody who's there, um, play with the reader's expectations a bit. And I also think kind of, I'm, I'm kind of a fan of short chapters, um, and I think that the I think a short ch chapter ending on a little bit of a cliffhanger is yes. always a good a good little tip uh, to to go on. Cliff cliffhangers for the win. Um, there's some people don't like them, but definitely short chapters with a cliffhanger is is definitely a way. Yeah. It's one of those. Yeah. When people talk about not being able to put the book down, that is one of the big reasons as to why. Um, could you expand on how to make a cliffhanger? I see you get in, out, and get the job done. So a chapter is basically um, what what do you want? To, and I always do this. You know what happens now? What you know? Go in. You know with a bit of a bang. You know mm. straight into character. What's happening? Um, so a cliffhanger is just, you know, rather than continuing with the, and then this, just think of the bit where it gets a bit more interesting. Mm. And then you can just let the reader read for a minute. They don't, I think, and I also think they shouldn't all have a cliffhanger because you're just going to be like exhausted <laughs> um, by that. Um, you need to let them, you know, you know, have time to sort of, you know, go to bed and wake up the next day. But, but, but mm. yeah, so I think, to me, a cliffhanger, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a cliffhanger is when there's a question. Is it maybe like a question? What's happening? I don't know. Do you think with um, having multiple narratives, do you think that helps with the cliffhanger construction in terms of you can leave sort yeah. of one character there and then you, you, you kind of want to know what's happening to them, but then you, you're faced with another one and then you're left wanting to know what's happening to them and then, oh, you're picking up this one again. I think it does, doesn't it? Um, I do mm. like playing with two different narratives. Um, I think it keeps it interesting for me as as a writer. Um, and it's a bit, I think it's a bit easier. Um, mm. Some people might disagree, but I, I, I think it's easier as a writer because you don't have to kind of, you know, one person to take the whole novel. You know, that's, mm. that's a challenge to me. Mm. Yeah, no. incredible. Have you ever read that review before? I read all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Is there is there one in particular you can remember, or is there one that you? I can you remember a, them. Have all. you had a bad one? I've had a couple of bad ones. Okay, yeah. okay. I, I, we amazingly, as authors, always remember the bad ones over the good ones. Oh, well, like yeah. yeah. Have, have you ever had a weird uh, a reader or a fan encounter <laughs> or a gift? No, but I hope I get one. I'm, I'm looking forward to weird gifts. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, we, we what, mentioned what would be before. what would be an acceptable gift? What would you be happy with? I mean, obviously, if a fan <laughs> of a book is giving you something, but I should imagine, obviously, with an adulteress, a murderer, and a prostitute, um, <laughs> you would get some pretty strange things. I I don't I don't I don't know. I've not I've not had any gifts. I don't know what what would be. Flexible or, or 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 borderline, mm. to be honest with you. Um, we spoke about this before, Chris, and and you and you asked the guests, and I'm going to ask this again. Would you accept, <laughs> say, you're at a book signing and someone bought you food? Would you take <gasps> the food and eat it? Is it a stranger? It's not my dad. Yeah, it's, it? it's, it's like a reader or, or someone that likes your work. Reader you like you like quiche or yeah. or no? <laughs> you? I, I probably wouldn't know. No. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't, I'm more, I don't know. Imagine getting that one person that just brings you like biscuits in a certain shape, maybe, maybe a dagger, um, yeah. and then they wait for you to eat the biscuit in front of them. Like, <laughs> yeah, they yeah, stand yeah. there watching eagerly. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. Well, I'm not, not going nice. to eat that. I'm not um, going to eat yeah. biscuit shaped dagger, a dagger shaped biscuit. Interestingly, in the chat, JP says, sometimes I buy books based on the one stars, which is a very interesting oh. statement. I'm, I suppose if you're looking at a book and you see the one stars, for example, I'm going to talk about my own book, Slanderless. Um, I've got some good reviews, but I've also got a few bad reviews due to the grammar. I did this all myself and it was I'm quite open about the process and and the grammar issues. 
in that book, it talks about if you if you're a grammar uh, nerd or whatever they call, you really interested in your grammar being correct. Probably not the book for you, but if that's not an issue, you like the book. So in that sense, I can see that being a thing. Um, but I'm not sure what other situation that might be beneficial. But it's an interesting concept. Mm. Mm. Well, Kate, do you do you read reviews of books before you buy them? Yeah. Or do you just read a blurb? Yeah. No, I like I, I, I kind of judge a book by its cover. Yeah. It's very shallow with me. Um, I do. I go by the cover, and I go by the. I probably go less by the, uh, you know, little reviews. But I, um, yeah, probably a, a good reads review would probably be a big, a big um, help to me. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I don't think it's shallow. I think a lot more people than people who admit them to themselves actually judge a book by the cover. Um, yeah. Not just yeah, covers, I mean, straight I, I, edges I, I, now. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah. That, if you've got them, thing. you're on for a win because yeah, I, 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 and I do. I mean, I, I, I you know, and I judge it well, but mm. I think that um, there's so much work that goes into the covers, and that's why you know, huge amount of work um, mm. goes into making that cover just right for the for the the market and and and, and for the story. So, in the top corner, we've got your book, The Maiden, um, yes. and that is a very a very floral picture with uh, a white gowned person in the middle. Correct. And the book we've got here is not the same. It's still floral, but very different. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that's Why the proof. These are proofs. So right? Yeah, you've got so the proofs were done um, in the kind of, um, obviously before the cover was finalized. Mm. And they're, they're, there's quite a lot. There's quite a lot. Of, I've only got one proof. Um, <laughs> I gave one to my to my best friend and she still got it. Um, and then I found one. I found one at, a, at an event, and I and I just took it. So uh, <laughs> I wrote I'm having that. That's my book. My book. Yeah. Um, so um, that so that's the proof. So that just went goes out to reviewers. Um, they're scared. I don't think there's any left now. So, but this is the this is the the cover, and that's the hardback cover. So I think I, I be quite a, like that cover though. That's that's just a very similar color a cover. Yeah. To mm. another book um, called *The Fair Botanists*, actually. Oh, okay. Similar, um, and and the, and and the, the illustrator who who did the cover for *The Maiden* um, is an illustrator called Charlotte Day, and she's just magnificently done this. And uh, there's some elements in that in that cover. I'll I'll do it like this, um, which are reflective of the. Of, oh, of I did story. see that. Yeah, they're shiny. So we've got we've got um, uh, a lady in a white a white. Cloak, who may or may not be the white lady of Christorfin. And we've got the guillotine, which is so beautifully Ooh, done. Yeah. You can't even tell it's a guillotine. I, didn't I couldn't tell that until you showed me. Isn't it just, yeah. yeah. Can you show us the sprayed edges again? Because I think that is a wonderful thing. That's my, I'm trying to yeah, do it. That's super cool. I know. And I've signed them as well. Ooh. Oh. Will you people. be one of these people um, that goes into, say, a supermarket and signs a book and leaves it in there? Oh, I would be. I mean, what happens if um, if they say, "Well, you've got to buy it now"? No, they can't do that to you. You're an author, surely. They. I don't get why people would do that because, it. yeah, mm -hmm. if you if you put that on social media, said I've signed this book in this shop, they'll get a load more people going there. Surely. Mm. I went into Waterstones the other day, um, and I knew that my book wasn't out yet, and I still went in to look for it, and just to see if they'd put it out, and they hadn't, obviously. <laughs> yeah. um, and I kind of sniffing around the books like quite suspiciously, and there was a, the, one of the sales assistants was there, and I was going to go up to her and sort of say something, and I, but I just ran out of the shop. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, I mean, guys. Uh, sorry, Chris. Just before you say that, I'm just going to give a heads up that in a couple of minutes we're going to get questions from you guys uh, for Kate and for us. Please start sending the questions in, and we'll get onto that very shortly. Sorry, Chris. Please resume. No, it's all right. I was going to say it's got a very sort of like. For me, it's got a bit of a handmade tale type of vibe. Are you? Yes, I do. Are you like hoping people obviously judge it by the cover? Um, yes. <laughs> nice, good spot, Chris. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just because I, if I saw that in a shop, I would be like, hmm, it's got a bit of a handmade tale sort of vibe. Let me pick it up and see what it's about. It does, doesn't it? Um, I don't, mm. I don't think that was part of the brief. 
um, and it's not dystopian or, or you know it's not like the handmaid's tale in terms mm. of the storyline i don't think but it does yeah. well, it's, a, it's a feminist you know the people calling it a feminist you know retelling and, and, and the things like this um yeah. that's a really big word but but you know, i suppose it's, it's in that kind of genre isn't it yeah how does that sit with you in terms of people labeling your book in certain categories already before before it's sort of come out and people haven't read it and you know some people instantly by what you just said might think oh yeah that's books for me i'm going to go and pick it up whereas other people might think oh, i'm not going to read that like just from a couple of words i find it really really bizarre mm. and it's really bizarre to see words you know you know people say things about your work which you hadn't really thought of mm. or, you know you know like you know feminist retelling that's a that's a big you know it's a big mm. expression but it is it is you know, that, that's how it's kind of i suppose as you know in a way that's what i was doing with it um and um and you know when people say even even crime interestingly because it won the pitch perfect um uh prize but so that's like a crime festival and i never saw myself as a crime a writer you know that's a whole but yeah. crime writers are clever and they're plotty and it's all kind of you know tart noir and all this and i just never i don't i can't sort of see that but people are calling it a crime because i suppose there's a trial and there's a murder and so it is a crime book Mm. How did you feel when you were nominated for that award, and were you expecting it at all? No, um, I I was in it was in lockdown, and I got an email from bloody. I mean, I'd, I'd pitched, you know, I'd, I'd sent my thing off, you know, four paragraphs of, you know, whatever. And at one point, I thought, I don't know if this is even the right thing, because you know, as I mm. say, I don't, I don't mm. know if my 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 book is what is what they're looking for. But then I, I did think, well, bloody Scotland, it's it's in Scotland, and there's quite a lot of blood. So I might as well just <laughs> and um I got an email from them saying congratulations and I screamed and I was in as I was in the living room and I screamed and my and my daughter was in the kitchen with her friend Nyla and they were they were eating birthday cake and Nyla picked up a knife because she thought that there was somebody had you know come into the house. She her reactions were really quick. She just kinda had this kind of like carving knife, you know, there. And she's only about twelve. Um, so I had to reassure them that nothing <laughs> like, knife away, obviously. Next story, 12-year-old murder of birthday cake setting. I love the idea you have to be nominated from Bloody Scotland if your book contains Scotland and blood. It did. And that was literally my kind of like, okay, well, it does that and it does that, so it's all right. Yeah, amazing. Cool. We're going to get some questions from the audience then. Um, it, it, it is amazing. to. Uh, have you been to Bloody Scotland? No, because that because we were in lockdown. And yeah. I had to do the whole thing on a, on a Zoom call like this. Well, when we went to Harrogate, that was one thing a lot of people said to us because it was next on the calendar for the crime world. They said, are oh, you going to Bloody Scotland? And we're like, no. And we weren't very aware of that at the time, but there was a lot of buzz for Bloody Scotland and it's apparently yeah, one of the best. I'm going this year. Absolutely. Maybe next year, Chris, we might get there. Um, okay, last little video. Please get your questions in for Kate and then we will play them. Um, they can be about writing, they can be about Edinburgh, they can be about, about pretty much anything. And um, we'll put relevant ones up on the screen. So send them in now, please. Community questions coming up. So Chris, start us off with the classic WCCS questions. Yeah, so our first um, chat show question is, if you could take any fictional character and make that character your own, which fictional character would you choose and why? So, I don't know if you'll know this character, guys, but um, this character is a girl called Margaret Simon, and she mm -hmm. is in a book called Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, by Judy Bloom, who's an American mm -hmm. author who, who was prolific uh, at writing coming-of-age novels um, in the 1970s. And there's a film coming out, um, it's coming out um, in a couple of weeks, Are, um, Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, based on the novel. Um, so she, Margaret Simon, is hitting puberty and it's all going, it's, it's, all, it's all going down. And she, <laughs> and Judy Bloom's novels were all kind of on that theme. Mm. And when I was a kid, you know, I, I just read all of them. Yes, yes. And <laughs> Margaret, Margaret's um, in, a, in a gang of girls, I think there's four of them, and it's kind of like a, who's going to get their period first in a club um and they do an exercise because they want to be kind of um 
they want to be sexy and they do an exercise um to increase their bust and they and they kind of move i'm not going to do it um <laughs> <laughs> And That's they go, a different I show, guys. I must, I must increase my bust. And this is, is and so everybody, and you know, when I was at school, we were all kind of doing this. And then, you know, it was all, it was really inspirational. But it's, um, so she's a great kind of, um, real kind of zesty, kind of amazing character who has, you know, really influenced the lives of, you know, girl, women everywhere. And I can't wait to see that film. Amazing. Mm. Great. What would you do with it? Well, that's the thing. I mean, I mean Margaret. So I don't think she'd fit into the sixth, uh, the seventeenth century very, very well. But I, I would love to put her in a kind of more modern context. She's just brilliant. Nice, fantastic. Okay, if you could change the ending to anything, TV, film, book, what ending are you changing? Uh, so, so I changed the ending of Fleabag. I never. Mm. Not. And, um, yeah. and I would have. Um, um, Fleabag and the priest get together. Mm. So, have you, so you've not seen Fleabag? Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, um, I think we've had someone say that before because it's quite a popular one that people were unsatisfied with, shall we say? Well, I mean, I think it was a good ending. I think it completely worked for the characters, but I'm quite romantic, and I would like to have seen them together. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, we do have a couple of questions in from the audience, so let's start asking those. Uh, Malingo, thank you. She says. How soon is too soon to fictionalize real life characters, especially when it's so often done about women who've been murdered for being women, stroke sex workers, etc.? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I know what you mean. I, I, I don't like recent real life crime. Um, I don't like, um, I wouldn't name them, but it's a couple of you know, kind of dramatizations that I'm just not very comfortable with. I think if they're, I think if you've got their relatives are still here, um, mm. particularly parents. Um, and just don't just don't go there. I think I think if you've kind of gone, you know, two or three generations down, I think it's okay. And if everybody's long dead, it's fine. It's a really interesting topic, that isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I just think, uh, uh, you know, we are, you know, we are quite a morbid, you know, we're kind of it's morbid fascination, isn't it? Um, and I think, you know, I think documentaries are all right, but I think when you start to fictionalise that things, I, I, I don't, mm. I don't like it. Mm. Yeah, great answer. Um, Anya says, train spotting one or two, which is the best. Um, oh, I know. Uh, so, <laughs> so train spotting one, obviously, for me, it's because I read the book. I was at university and it was very cool. So, yeah. I, I think it's point yeah. one. Definitely. Um, JP, thank you. If you were able to submit your pitch again, what would you do differently? If nothing, what do you think was the most successful part of your pitching process? Great question. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think I wouldn't dare to do it differently. Um, so what I think was the most successful part of my pitching process was I had done a lot of Zoom um, or had done a lot of presentations before this. Um, and, I, and I had been doing, it happened to be on Zoom, but you know that's just because it was the way it was. I had done a lot of live interviews when I was having to um, do, I was doing, um, through, through lockdown and the pandemic, I was having to do um, live interviews with the First Minister of Scotland and having to pitch questions to a live audience. And it was really, really tense, um, mm. really tense situation. So I had, and I hated it. And I, and I don't like doing live stuff as a journalist because you kind of have to be, you know, you know you're kind of doing your mm. thing. It's just not what I'm good at as a journalist, but I do it because it's, you know, it's, it's one of the things that, um, you know, I, I do for my job. So having done that a few times and having, you know, kind of put myself into a really uncomfortable um out of my comfort zone, it was was ultimately really helpful because I had I had enough confidence in myself to know that I could actually just get through this situation. Mm. We've got a question for you in terms of journalism. And if you um, if you could go back throughout history and be the journalist to break a story, Ooh, yeah. which story would you pick and, and why? Oh my goodness! <laughs> um, I don't really that's know. A, that's a brilliant question, Chris. I like that. Oh, I don't really know. Um, okay, there, there was another question. I'll let you have a little think on that. Uh, there was a bit of a morbid one, and I'll, right. I'm going to ask you, but nobody can take this as advice. And if they, if somebody ends up buried here, <laughs> not blame the chat show. So if you had to kill someone, where in Edinburgh is the best place to bury a body? Where is the best place to bury a body? In my, um, my Under my son's bed, actually. Because <laughs> <laughs> Which is a great answer. Yeah, yeah, it's a good yeah. answer. Um, but yeah, going back to the breaking news story, 
what would you have liked to have written? The thing is about that is that I always think if you, like, so yes, but when you're breaking a news story, that inevitably, you know, something's gone wrong for somebody somewhere. Um, and I don't really want, you know, and that's why I don't, don't say, oh, I was the person that, you know, broke, you know, that Lady Di um, Princess Di's death. You know, it's a kind of, a, you know, um, in order for you to break the story, there has to have been a, a big a disaster. So that's I, why, that's I, why I don't want to it. If I was a journalist, I would like to do the one that the BBC did on April Fool's when they said that spaghetti grows on trees, because that was a brilliant yeah. April Fool. Actually, I think actually um, Dolly the sheep. That's a good story. I wish I'd broken that. So the world's first cloned sheep, and I did yeah. have a couple of stories about about Dolly the sheep. But I, I would love to have been the person that broke that story. Amazing. Mm, one more question before we finish off. Um, final questions for you is from Ross and he says what's the scariest alien character from a Spielberg film who needs to phone home Chris what <laughs> yeah okay basically they, they're all, they've been tapping me up all show about my fear <laughs> of I, have a, I have a fear and phobia of ET and hey, since hey. I yeah <laughs> Since I told people about this on the show it's been a recurring theme so I just had to explain that little dig that people have put in there. But yes, it is E.T. Ross. Thank you, smart ass. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris. Um, <laughs> Kate, sorry. Uh, before we wrap this up, where can people find out more about you and where can they buy The Maiden? Uh, well, you can find me on Twitter at Kate Foster Media um, or on Instagram at Kate Foster Author. And you can buy the maiden literally anywhere. It's um, it's there's a Waterston special edition, but it's also available in all good independent bookshops. Amazing. Does the Waterstones edition have the sprayed edges? <laughs> <laughs> it's a yes, it does. Look, yes, wicked. It's so good. Get get it from there. Looks wicked. Um, thank you, Kate, so much. You've been a fantastic guest, and we've loved hearing your story and your journey. Um amazing i hope you've had a good time chris have you got any more questions uh no i'm just you know really excited for you for you over the next two weeks you know the book coming out i'm going to bloody scotland and festival so i just wish you the very best of luck with that uh thank, and thank you. you so much for coming on oh no it's been a real it's been a, it's been a laugh definitely <laughs> A great launch and of course we'll support you as best we can as well um thank you guys for tuning in please join us again next week show your support for the show leave a like leave a comment and all that good stuff thank you so much for joining us on a friday night and have a great weekend and if you're writing please write well if you're reading let us know what you're reading um it'd be good to see all of those uh comments thank you again so much and we'll see you all very soon Bye bye guys <laughs>